sometimes I make it up as I go along. And I, I, was, I was thinking about our staff meeting that we had this morning. And we were talking about this new test called the Cardio VIP from Spectracell. It has nothing to do, well, maybe it does, with what we're talking about tonight. But it's a, a great test. It gives all kinds of information. And somebody said, so I bet all the cardiologists in town are using this test, aren't they? And I said, no. And then we talked about why. And the reason is that the cardiologists in town and the hospitals get paid to take care of sick people. Sick people. And the hospitals get paid for procedures and surgeries and in the context of seeing patients, patients are kind of ground through like widgets on an assembly line every five or ten minutes because if you go slower than that, your practice will implode financially. And as a result, the preventative type stuff is not done. So tonight we're going to talk about preventative stuff. I hope that you're interested in the title and the FUD factor. I, I promise it's not profane or vulgar, and I will define it as we get there. So here's my focus for tonight. What most people don't know about what they're eating and why they're gaining weight and or why they can't lose weight. How does this eating and insulin thing work? And I love Dirty Harry. Do you feel lucky? <laughs> So we're going to be talking about what your actual risk factors are and if you feel lucky. And finally, what did the doc do? I mean, I'm not going to tell you anything that I haven't done myself. Uh, speaking of which, as I buttoned my coat for tonight, I realized that I was able to button it over the microphone that I'm using. And I got to thinking about all the lies I had told myself in the past when I got to be the typical over 50 pudgy doctor, al almost a, uh, uh, what is the word, a caricature of the physician le leading a poor lifestyle. And, you know, my shirt collars would get a little bit tight and say, well, you know, they must have shrunk at the cleaners after all those uh, washings. And my coats would get tied as I was about to lecture. I'd say, well, you know, I must not have, I must not have uh, accounted for the fact that I was going to be wearing microphones. No, I was just getting fat. And so I will tell you that I buttoned it tonight. Hopefully the suit line looks good. Okay, let's keep going and talk about what St. Augustine had to say. He said, the world is a book and those who do not travel read only a page. So on my, on my travels, I've seen some very interesting things. In Atlanta, Georgia, they have grindhouse burgers, killer burgers, they call them. And they further say, live fast and eat well. Women cry for it. Men die for it. And truly, men are dying for that, and also women, too, for the excess saturated fat and calories. Saw this the last time I went through. This was on a trip back and forth from San Antonio. The Cinna Sweeties, bite-sized donut treats. And I actually walked, walked past that, and I thought, hmm, I don't have a trace of hunger for that. Used, used to, I mean, boy, that smells good. Not a trace this time. And I will tell you as we go on what happened. But I mean, temptation is all around us. We, we can get easily distracted and just kind of you know, make, a, make a detour into some of these places if we're not watching what we're doing with disastrous results. So it would be a pun to say that obesity is a growing problem. But I, I will say it's definitely growing. It's increasing. The percentage of overweight or obese people in our society has been going up, and this is old data right here. Um, as of the last collection, the NHANES data that I saw, 99 to 2002, was 65% obese, excuse me, overweight or obese with a BMI greater than 25. That's, that's pretty plump. And obese, a BMI of 30, that's just obviously fat, 31%. Um, this is where we've been in terms of overweight rates. We are, again, leading the world. Here we've got Canada, England, Spain, Austria, France, Korea. We are leading the world 
in obesity. And, and right now, um, we have about 72% obesity, and out in 2020, it's going to be around 75%. Uh, I showed this one the, t the last time I lectured, and I think it's very interesting. This is the obesity rate among adults. And down here, you see that the United States is kind of at the, at the bottom. We have more, uh, we have more uh, percentage of the adult population right here that are obese. And this is, um, this is self-reported. One of these is self-reported data. This is measured data, and this is self-reported data over here. And here's kids. So the take-home message of, of this one is that around 2007, 2008, 20% of our kids are obese, which is shocking. Not overweight, obese. So is there a day of reckoning in your future? Possibly. If we keep eating the way we're eating and not getting adequate nutrients. So I was curious, how much would a heart attack cost exactly? Many people say, well, you know, if it doesn't kill me, that's okay, or a kind of Nietzschean perspective, that which does not kill me makes me strong. But what would actually happen to your bank account if you had one? And the answer is it would cost you about total, you and society, about a million bucks. And that's lost productivity, lost wages, inability to work, direct medical care, hospital care, intensive care, possibly surgery, rehab at a rehab facility so that you're not a cardiac cripple, about a million bucks. Now, I grant you, you might have an economical heart attack that, that wouldn't suck that much out of the system, but about a million. And this is a national business group on health. M mind you, you're not going to be writing a check for a million dollars, but you, you, you dot all the I's, cross all the T's, wrap everything up, about a million bucks. So here are the weight stats. 70% of adults are overweight, 20% of children are obese, and as Lisa opened up, obesity is a killer. So, last time I gave this lecture, I had three fat loss secrets. I have doubled that for tonight. So, fat loss secret number one is control your blood sugar. And that means don't be eating those Cinnasweeties in the Atlanta airport. Let's talk about this glycemic index. A glycemic index talks about how fast you spike your blood sugar as a function of what you just put into your mouth. The higher the number, the greater the blood sugar response, and this is what it looks like. So this is a food with a high glycemic index. You take it, boom, your blood sugar goes up like that and your insulin follows. This is a food with a low glycemic index. This, this would be like rice cakes which everybody thinks is a diet food, but it's actually, uh, it has the glycemic index of jelly beans. You might as well eat the jelly beans and enjoy yourself rather than fooling yourself into thinking you're, you're treating yourself healthfully. And this is more like sweet potatoes or vegetables. Ken, I'm getting a little warm. Lower, lower that slider there if you would. <clears throat> so this is what happens when you eat food that spikes your blood sugar. So let's start out with a typical day. Here you have a high glycemic meal, the perfect American diet breakfast. Whole wheat toast, orange juice, and coffee. Guaranteed to spike your blood sugar. Uh, I will tell you from personal experience, my oldest son uh, has insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, and he's been kind of like a little physiological experiment at times. His blood sugar goes down, I give him orange juice. It brings it back up. Orange juice is one of the best things to raise blood sugar because it's fast sugar. So that's what happens. Your sugar goes up, your insulin goes up. And then, lo and behold, because your insulin has gone up, your sugar comes down. Now, I want you to look at this. Sugar is going down, 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 down. Insulin is still up here. What do you think will happen? You'll get hungry because your blood sugar is going to bottom. That's reactive hypoglycemia. Some people uh, have, are more sensitive to it than others. So about this time, you're going to want to have a morning snack, like donuts at the nursing station or whatever, <clears throat> or rice cakes and coffee. And that'll, that'll take care of you to lunch, but then your blood sugar is dropping again because you're riding on that insulin wave. So then you have lunch. 
uh, maybe a Big Mac fries and shakes because you're, you're really hungry. And that'll spike your blood sugar up again. Then you'll have low energy. Then you'll need an afternoon snack. Actually, when I was on this teeter-totter over at Deaconess Hospital for a while before I started eating salads and getting myself under control, in the, mid, in the middle of the afternoon, I would sometimes have this compelling desire to go over to the cafeteria and get ice cream. I admit it. Okay, so you're still hungry. And so you have ice cream, Coke, and chips. And I actually... I had the ice cream and coffee. I didn't have the Coke and chips. And then, again, you're hungry, so you have dinner. And then, basically, all of this time that you're up here with your spiked blood sugar and your spiked insulin, this is fat city. This is where you are shoving glucose into your fat cells and, and excuse me, shoving glucose into your cells. And if your body doesn't need it, it says, oh, good, extra energy, I'll store that for the lean winter months ahead because we're still, you know, de dealing with millions of years of evolutionary pressure. So we, we put it on our butt or our gut or just all over our body or our, you know, fat little cheekies. Uh, it, it goes all over. So here's the benefit of the low glycemic eating. So when you eat low glycemic, which means you don't spike your blood sugar, you don't spike your insulin, you keep it right down here where you are using those calories for energy and you're not storing fat. So number one, control the blood sugar. Don't spike the insulin. <clears throat> fat loss secret number two, more small meals. Now I don't have a lot about this. I will tell you that one of the preeminent experts on fitness and transforming your body, Bill Phillips, published a book many years ago called Body for Life. And he talked about six small meals per day with a protein and a carb. Not M&M's carb, but um, something grain or vegetable. Uh, vegetables are carbs. Small meals. <clears throat> Fat loss secret number three, eat more protein. This is why so many people screw up when they're trying to lose weight, is they're not getting enough protein in. So I have several, several illustrations for you. And by the way, I'm going to put this on SlideShare. So if you want to write this down, slideshare.net forward slash LKDMD. Or you can just download our app, and I'll eventually link it out on our app so you can just go through the presentation. So... How much protein do you need? We're going to get there. I actually have a new slide. We're going to get there. But here's, here's how much you got per egg. Six grams per egg. And you're going to hear me talking about 30 grams of protein three times a day. Ladies and gentlemen, that's five eggs in the morning. That's more, th more than I can eat. 22 grams of protein uh, for salmon. 28 grams for a nice lean chicken breast. Uh, 50 grams of cooked lentil. Uh, eight grams, so you'd have to eat, uh, what, four of those to get 30. You'd have to eat 200 grams. Or cheese, and when you eat cheese, then you get fat. So you, you, have, to, you have to look, you get, you get fats from it. So. so how much do you need? Here's how you can figure out how much protein you actually need. You take your target weight, let's say, let's say you want to lose down to 150 pounds or 170. We'll call it 170. So you take that and divide it by 2.2. That's your target weight. And then you multiply that weight, which is now in kilograms, by a factor of 1.6 and divide that number by 3 for your protein intake. Now that's theoretically how you do it. Here's an example. Let's say you're 250 pounds and you want to lose exactly 24 pounds. You want to go down to 226 pounds. So you take your desired weight, 226 pounds, divide it by 2.2, that's 103 kilograms. That's going to be your final weight. 103 kilograms times 1.6 is 164 grams of protein per day. You divide that by three. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to have 55 grams of protein per meal. That's a lot of protein. <clears throat> and it's interesting to note that the more conservative figures on protein was calculated by dietitians in hospitals who were trying to keep people out of renal failure. 
So you get some old person there that their kidneys are teetering on an edge, there's a limit to how much protein they can take. But you get a young, healthy person that is exercising, building muscle, and trying to burn fat, they need more protein. Now, there are a number of thoughts about this. You can, you can get other, other recommendations if you want, but this is actually in a guide for a product I'll be telling you about. Here's the reason that most weight loss programs do not work. Because when, you, when most people lose weight, they starve themselves. They, they do it by the fingernail technique, which is hanging on by their fingernails and just gutting it out and going to bed hungry and not getting enough calories and not getting enough protein. So what happens is you lose the weight, right here, but you also lose muscle mass. So 40% of the weight loss in a typical diet comes out of your muscles. What happens when you refeed yourself? You just burned up part of your metabolic compartment, your muscles, so every calorie that you consume after you do your diet goes to your butt or your stomach. I'm, I'm getting more blunt as I lecture because I want to make sure that people get it when, when I talk about it. So here's an example. Let's say you're this hunk of uh, male virtue right here and you are six feet tall and 250 pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, that is obese. 33.9 is that BMI. That dude is obese. And this dude is obese. So which obese person would you rather be? <laughs> would you rather be this obese person or this obese person? You know, most of us would be this obese person. Why should that person be considered obese? Because all of this muscle weighs. So it r ramps up the weight. So based on conventional charting for conventional people carrying conventional amounts of flab and conventional amounts of poor muscle, he's obese. Which of these women would you like to be? Would you like to be the fatty over here at 136 pounds or the trim one right here at 127 pounds? You were, okay. You're right. Why, why, why should this woman weigh more? And by the way, it's the same woman. Why should she weigh more but look thinner? More muscle. I knew this was a fast audience. So <laughs> lean muscle equals your metabolic engine. This is where you burn fat. So here is the traditional calorie restricted diet and you lose muscle as well as fat. Let's see if this is animated here. I believe it is. Yes. So you lose fat and you also you lose muscle. Let's go back. Let's watch that again. Let's watch this muscle compartment shrink down, 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 down. You see the muscle shrink? Okay, this is the protein heavy, calorie restricted, and you, you maintain more lean muscle. So what you're gonna see here, this is gonna shrink down, 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 down. This is gonna stay the same, watch. How'd that happen? You feed the person adequate protein, and then you have some rational exercise. So here you have, uh, you're, you're lowering your metabolic burn here, and here you're increasing your metabolic burn because you have, you're maintaining your muscle and you're eating well and exercising. So again, here's the normal calorie diet, 2,000 kilocalories. And here's the typical reduced calorie diet. So let's check this out again in slow motion. So right here, here's the normal diet, 90 grams of protein, okay? You stop eating so many calories, and your protein shrink. Now you're only getting 45 grams of protein per day. Remember the 200 person that wanted to be 226 pounds needs 164 grams of protein. This poor soul is getting 45. Obviously it's not gonna work. Here's the muscle retention eating plan. You cut down on the carbs, you keep your proteins. You cut down on the, well, I guess it's not gonna do that. You keep your proteins at 90 grams and you cut down on your carbs and you cut down on your fats. Okay, this is the way most people eat during the day. They uh, have, they don't have protein in breakfast, they don't have much protein at lunch, and then they have a steak or big chicken breast or whatever at dinner so they get their protein load one time a day at night. This is the best way to do it where you're getting it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you spend more time in the metabolic 
burn zone. And then if you really want to go for the gusto, you want to be at the top of the class, then you can give yourself a little protein here, a little protein here, just something to keep your burn going. Multiple small meals. Okay, last time I gave a talk like this, I teased it with telling people I was going to tell the people that showed up the single most important thing to do if they wanted to lose weight. And I will tell you that. The single most important thing to do, and Tim Ferriss in his book, The 4-Hour Body, talked about this, 30 grams of protein within an hour of getting up. It is critical. And it works. I lived it. <clears throat> Fat loss secret number four, get your hormones checked. I've heard people say over and over, it must be in my glands. And it may be. Dr. Gabhart, my naturopath, uh, and I, Dr. Gabhart is the woman I consider the diva of hormones at Katie Wellis Institute. Uh, she grooves on hormones the way I groove on neurochemistry and nutrition. But the pituitary up here secretes thyroid stimulating hormone to go to the thyroid, which makes thyroid hormone T4, which is ultimately metabolized to free T3, which does thyroid things to the body. There is this evil twin, reverse T3, which goes up with stress. If you don't have enough free T3, or if you have too much reverse T3, you get fat, or run down, or start losing your eyebrows, or start having your hair fall out. It's a bad situation. Fat loss number secret, fat loss secret number five, make it idiot proof. I need idiot proof. This is idiot proof. This is, this is a product called TR90 <clears throat> that I use that I will show you what the results were. And this is what I like about it. So this one is the high quality pea protein. It's gluten free. Uh, dairy free, practically everything free. It, it's, it's made of plant protein. And so one scoop has 100 calories and 8 grams of carbs. Oh, and I'm sorry, I should have put protein. Protein, 15 grams right there. So two scoops, let's see if we can do the math. Two scoops would be 200 calories and 30 grams. So if you want 30 grams, 200 calories, that's a third of your protein that you need for the day, 30. But it's about a seventh of your calories, even if you're doing 1,500 calorie diet. So that means you've got room later in the day to eat. And this is easy. This is what I drink in the morning, every morning, 30 grams of protein, and I'm not hungry until lunch. Fat loss secret number six. This is your last fat loss secret tonight. Use secret weapons. Now, this is a secret weapon over here that most people do not know about, and it's gene mapping and actual gene modification, so-called epigenetics, by things that you feed the person. You can actually talk to your genes by the food that you put in your mouth. Now, that may seem strange, but I am actually going to show it to you. All right, so one of the things that you hear from this company that has TR90 is this talk about youth gene clusters and how your genes, these are, I believe, on and these are off, as a young person change as you age. I'm going to show you some gene maps in a second. Just for right now, just go with me. And I thought youth gene clusters, I mean, Gag me. Uh, it, was, it wasn't, it, it wasn't uh, compatible with what I had heard before. So let me show you what ostensibly happens. Here's the gene expression reset, and this is with something called age lock technology. And age lock is just basically um, a cocktail of components that change gene expression. Now, I, I emphasize that this is, there's this company, uh, Pharmanex, that has these products, but they don't have a corner on this market. And I'm going to show you how people have actually done it. Here's, here's another example of gene mapping. This was 
the mind-numbing title, Comparative Genomics of Fungal Allergens and Epitopes Show Widespread Distribution of Closely Related Allergen and Epitope Orthologs. <laughs> Great if you have insomnia. So these were the yeast species right here, and these were the specific genes. So they were looking at gene expression per species. So you say, yes, but what does that have to do with me? I'm a person, not a yeast. So if you're a guy, this should be very interesting. This is Dean Ornish's work, Changes in Prostate Gene Expression in Men Undergoing an Intensive Nutrition and Lifestyle Intervention. So what Dean Ornish did, <clears throat> he did a gene map of what these prostate cancer guys had in terms of their gene expression. And then he did a nutritional intervention. We're not talking about pumping them full of supplements. We're talking about changing their diet. More fruits and vegetables, less red meat, more organic, more fish, etc. Let's look at what happened. So here we have the pre-intervention, and you, you'll see not a lot of green going on. Here we have the post-intervention. You all see a difference there? This is food talking to your genes. And this is not just one study. This is over and over and over. What you can do is you can modify gene expression. Now, you can't modify the color of your hair, or if you're going to lose your hair, if you're a guy, or you know, the color of your eyes. You can't modify those genes. Those are fixed. But in terms of genes having to do with obesity, you can modify it. I'm going to show you that. So what you eat talks to your genes and changes their expression. Okay, let's take a look at these two identical twins. They have the same DNA, but different gene expression. As a result, one's thin, one's fat. Same DNA. What's different? You say, well, one, one ate more calories. That's true. One did meet, eat more calories, no doubt but one also changed her gene expression. If you want to change your, change your gene expression, eat lots of carbs, spike your blood sugar, let it crash, tell your body, you know, you're, you're always going to have to be ready to come to the rescue because your blood sugar is going to keep plummeting, that would be a good way to talk to your genes and get them for this gene expression right here. The other thing is that when you change your gene expression, you change the amounts of these compounds, ghrelin, leptin, and we talked about insulin. And these actually speak to the hypothalamic area of the brain where your appetite control is, and they will make you hungrier and make you eat more, or the converse, depending on your gene expression. So here's one way to do it. Um, you have an eating plan designed to complement some supplements and it supports metabolically active lean muscle. This is the program. I'm not going to bore you with the details. It does have a jump start program, uh, some supplements, and then the trim shake. This is the eating program, uh, which is really beautifully balanced. You'll notice at least 30 grams of protein at breakfast, at least 30 grams of protein at lunch, and at least 30 grams of protein at dinner. Now, I could eat this. An egg omelet in the morning? Yep, I could do that. And a protein shake? Yep, I could do that. Or I can just knock down a protein shake. A snack? Yogurt, cottage cheese, nuts. One ounce. One ounce of nuts. That's nothing. The, how, how many ounces of nuts in a little thing of almonds? Like four, five? I get them all the time at Schnucks. Just a little handful. Gulp, I'm, I'm done with my snack. This is an easy eating program. And you can do fun things with it. This is a uh, TR90 green shake with blueberries in it and made with, I believe it was rice milk. It is absolutely delicious. Okay, so you remember I showed you that picture of the guy with the, with the hamburger and then we talked about heart attacks and how much they would cost. So let me grade now from the waistline to your mortality. <clears throat> so it's very interesting that in this article they were talking about oxidative stress causing decreased membrane fluidity of erythrocytes, those are red blood cells, of cardiovascular or coronary artery disease patients. What does that mean? It means that if you have a poor antioxidant status, that you're going to have changes 
in the ease that your red blood cells can go through your arteries. That's what that's talking about. So this is one study, but here's another one. Uh, uh, oxidative stress and accumulated fat is an important pathogenic, that means causative mechanism of obesity associated metabolic syndrome. In other words, the lower your antioxidant level, likelier the, the fatter you can get. Here's another study. This is the Epidemiology of Vascular Aging Study. They looked at 1,389 patients ages 59 to 71 over nine years. At the end of the study, they, they printed the betting odds. So the betting odds were that if you were a man in the lowest quintile of carotenoids, so a quintile is like first quintile, second quintile, third quintile, fourth quintile, fifth quintile, it's every 20% coming up. So zero to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60. So if you were in the underachieving group, zero to 20, per, uh, zero to 20 percent, your risk of dropping over dead of anything, that's called all-cause mortality. That means traffic wrecks, strokes, heart attacks, uh, cutting yourself and bleeding out, I don't know, anything that can kill you, that rate, that risk went up about threefold. And the cancer risk went up about double. Now this is if you're in the bottom quintile. Quote, total plasma carotenoid levels were independently associated with mortality risk in men. Guys, if I were you, I'd want to know where my level is. This was, this is for the women. This is breast cancer. So most men have a prostate and most women have breasts. And those that don't have breast because they had breast cancer, that's unfortunate, but we're going to talk about cancer risk. That's the reason we're talking about this. So this looked at eight cohort studies, which was precisely 80% of the entire world's published studies that had this cohort. In, a, in other words, they started at the beginning, they had a non-breast cancer group and a breast cancer group, and they followed it through to the end. And they found, now this is the kind of descriptive part, I'm going to show you the graph in a second, that women women with higher circulating levels of these carotenoids may be at a reduced risk of breast cancer. So this is how the data showed up. So the line in the middle is a relative risk of one. And you'll notice at the bottom that there's a 0.8 and a 1.2. This is a relative risk. So if you had a relative risk of breast cancer of 1.2, that means your risk of breast cancer would be 20% more than normal. If you had a relative risk of 0.8, this means your risk of breast cancer would be roughly 20% less than normal. So what they did is they looked at all these different categories of carotenoids, and they also looked at the total carotenoids. And you'll see that it goes down this way, this way, that's about the same, this way, this way, and this way. And if you look at that bottom number, right there, this is for the top quintile, the top quintile of carotenoids. So if you are in the top quintile of carotenoids, your relative risk is 0.8. The translation is, if you are in the top quintile of carotenoids, your risk of breast cancer, according to this study, is 20% less than random. Doesn't mean that it's going to prevent breast cancer, but, I mean, if I told you if you take this pill and you go out and you have a 20% less risk of dying before you get home in a traffic accident tonight, wouldn't you be interested in taking that pill? Move your head up and down if, 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 if you don't want to die on the way home. <clears throat> All right, this is tocopherols, which are vitamin E, inhibit oxidative and nitrosative stress in estrogen-induced early mammary hyperplasia in this type of rat. So the translation is oxidative stress is known to play a key role in estrogen-induced breast cancer. So, all right, so here's a kind of gruesome way to look at it. We have the uh, Tropicana Casino here in town. So you go to the Tropicana Casino, and by the way, I suggest that people never go there. It's a tax on the poor. You're going to lose your money. But for the people that go there, they're going to play the odds. And so there was this study 
that struck me as kind of a Tropicana style study. And this question asks, what are the betting odds that somebody in our nursing home is going to die? <laughs> Who's going to go first? It was like one of those betting pools, right? <laughs> now, they didn't actually place bets, but the title, Lipid Peroxidation, Antioxidant Status, and Survival in Institutionalized Elderly, a five-year longitudinal study. So what they found was that plasma malondialdehyde predicted mortality independently of anything else. In other words, the lower, excuse me, the higher your plasma malondialdehyde, which is a marker of oxidative stress, the more likely you were to die. And they also found out that beta carotene and alpha tocopherol, that's one of the vitamin E components, were independently associated with survival. So high oxidative stress, bad. You're going to die earlier. Antioxidant treatment, good. It'll keep you going longer. That's what this study showed. <coughs> Here's another one. Serum alpha carotene concentrations and risk of death among U.S. adults. This was the uh, NHANES study. Serum alpha carotene concentrations were inversely associated with risk of death from, check this out, all causes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all other causes. That actually was in the abstract. The only thing that I can think of is that the authors really wanted to get this all causes in there because they said it twice. <clears throat> okay, so what about people with brains, which hopefully is all of us here? I, I started my career here in Evansville in 1993. I was just focused totally on by the book psychiatry. Take two Prozac, don't call me in the morning. But then, then I got more enlightened and I began to use vitamins and supplements and fish oil and do uh, food allergy testing and things like that. So back in June, I had a quick little skim through the literature and this is what I found. So if you go to pubmed.gov, not club med, but pubmed, publishedmedicine.gov, and type in oxidative stress and the affliction of your choice. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, thyroid cancer, whatever you want to put in, you will find this. So oxidative stress and Alzheimer's, 4,706 citations. My mother died of Alzheimer's. Mild cognitive impairment, 212. Parkinson's disease, 3,579. My dad died of Parkinson's disease and complications. Multiple sclerosis, 488. I have a pharmaceutical representative that I know somewhere in the tri-state that's dealing with that. Macular degeneration, my dad had that, 634. Joint pain, hey, this is a great one for the chiropractors and we have two with us tonight. Rheumatoid arthritis, here's cancer, 14, look at that, 14,071. That's like almost four times as much as Alzheimer's. Colon cancer, 694. Breast cancer, 1,100. I mean, if you got a brain or a body, don't you want to know where your number is and do something about it in terms of oxidative stress? Oh, and by the way, we can measure it. So carotenoids are basically the first line of defense in terms of oxidative stress. And carotenoids come from the colorful fruits and vegetables that we eat. And you can also get them in addition to that with supplementation. Now, there are two ways to measure carotenoids and oxidative stress. One is painful, expensive, and you have to wait two to four weeks to get the results. The other is cheap, painless, and you get instant results. Now, which of those sounds like a good deal to you all? Marty, which sounds good to you? The second one. The second one. Okay. So this is the first way, this is the painful way and expensive. This is like $300 for this test and insurance does not cover it. So this person had elevated lipid peroxides, um, elevated superoxide dismutase, uh, low cysteine, marginal glutathione, his, and the total antioxidant capacity was low. My net impression was profoundly low antioxidant status. Now this is one way to do it. This is the other way to do it. This is with the S3 biophotonic scanner. I think there are at least two here tonight at CWI. There's one back there and there's one in my exam room. If you want to get scanned tonight, we can do it for you. So this is Claudia, my office manager. And this is a wireless unit. 
you put your hand on this thing, it scans you and it, it gets what's called a Raman score, which I'll show you in a second. It, show, it shows up on that uh, head unit right there. So this was originally developed at the University of Utah for looking at the back of eyes because it, the thinking was that low carotenoids, particularly zeaxanthin and lutein, in the back of the eye at the macula, low levels were associated with macular degeneration. Oh, but how can you find that out? Most people will not let you take a biopsy of their macula because you will make them blind. So there had to be a way to get that level. And so these dudes figured out how to do it. They were going to fire a laser beam back there and measure the frequency that came back. Now it had to be a very precise low energy laser beam or they'd blow out the back of the person's eyes like Star Wars. So it was a very, very precisely controlled laser and it used this Raman technology. And this is Raman technology. So here's how it goes. A blue light beam is shot down and the little blue photons are counted as they come out of the machine. And as the blue photons hit this carotenoid molecule, which technically is an alternating double bond carbon-based molecule, it soaks up some of the energy. As it soaks up some of the energy, it shifts the frequency to a longer frequency. So it shifts it from 473 nanometers, which is right here, to 510 nanometers, which is right here, or blue to green. And so you count the number of the little blue photons that go out, you count the number of the little green photons that come back, and boom, the machine computes it and gives you a carotenoid score. And I think, I think that's as much as I'm going to tell you about that scanner. And with that carotenoid score, you'll know what your antioxidant level is. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. There are, there are five color, color codes on the bottom of the little card that is used. One is F, that's less than 10. One is D, one is C, one is B, one is A. 50,000 and up, you're golden. Your antioxidant score is good. I, I, I propose to people to get it as high as they can, but uh, 50,000 and up is better. This is the uh, supplement that we use, one of them, Life Pack Nano, complete balance. I'm not here to sell product. I'm just telling you what we use here. This is a complete balanced multivitamin, multimineral supplement. It is cheaper than you could go to GNC and get the different components or any other health food place or buying it from Amazon. It is cheaper and it is better. It's also guaranteed, by the way. If your antioxidant score doesn't go up in two months on this, you get all your money back. So I like that. It's no risk for the patient. It's called risk reversal. These are, as the song has it, a few of my favorite things. This is what's in two packets. This is what I take every day. The B12, or the B vitamins, up at the top lower your homocysteine. And lowering your homocysteine, number one, lowers your risk of cardiovascular disease and lowers your amount of brain shrinkage as you age. I'm not going to show you every citation, but trust me, it's published. These right here, zinc, guys, this, this should be your favorite mineral because you got to have zinc to make testosterone. No zinc, no mojo. Selenium, for, particularly for women, this is critical because more women than men have thyroid problems. Selenium, you have to have selenium to make free T3. And you have to have iodine to make T4. So you've got to have both of those for your thyroid to work right. Chromium helps regulate uh, blood sugar. Vitamin C, most everybody knows about that, is a great antioxidant. And vitamin A and 83% of it is in beta carotene, not alpha carotene, beta carotene and plant extracts. That's correlated with your carotenoids and your antioxidant status as well. So let's talk about the FUD factor. I'm, I'm actually making very good time as we go through this talk. I love FUD because it's so amusing to see it in the popular press. If you are a Mac fanboy or fangirl or fan person, if that's more politically correct. You have seen this. And so 
recently, for example, I believe in the last couple of days, I have seen people predicting the doom of Apple Inc. Because, number one, Steve Jobs isn't there anymore. Number two, now they're talking darkly about the, I, the new iPhone is going to cannibalize part of the uh, iPad sales and therefore it's not going to work. In the past it was antenna gate, oh this is terrible. Um, there was uh, screen gate, uh, all, all different. And it, it, it's like hammering a company with fear, uncertainty, and doubt just to drive their stock price down. Well, the same thing has been done in terms of nutrition. And there were a couple of very interesting studies, and I use the term generously, in December of 2013 published in the Annals of Internal Medicine that basically said vitamins don't work. So there are lots of things that I could show you, but I do not want to bog down. So in the interest of time, this is the official Doc Katie reporting to you of how you can lie on your studies. So first of all, you use a bad control group. Now, this was the t testosterone and mortality study, and I actually put down, uh, use, use a therapeutic placebo. So we could combine this and this. So let me tell you about the testosterone study. Let me ask you some questions. How many of you have seen the commercials on TV? Did you know testosterone is associated with increased cardiovascular mortality and strokes? Then you need to call the law firm of, how many of you have seen those commercials? Quite a number of you, very good. Do you know that that study that was published was only done in the last year and flies in the face of every other study published? What the literature says, and I say this without fear of contradiction, you can go home and look it up tonight. Having an adequate amount of testosterone, if you are a guy as you age, burns visceral adipose fat, improves your mood or keeps it up, improves your cognition or keeps it up, increases your muscle mass so you don't get weak and feeble, increases your bone strength, and decreases your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And oh, by the way, it decreases your risk of prostate cancer. That is not what is commonly published, but if you look at the whole medical literature, decreases the risk of prostate cancer. That's published by Morgenthaler, M-O-R-G-E-N-T-A-L-E-R, -E -E one of the gurus of testosterone. So that's what the literature says. This study said, oh, the guys that were in the testosterone group, they had like twice the rate of death of, of those guys in the control group. So therefore, testosterone's a killer. <clears throat> what they didn't tell you is how they designed the study. Now, I know that this is not a lecture about testosterone, but I'm passionate about it because I got a lot of guys on testosterone. I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about supplementation. What they didn't tell you about the study is they asked themselves, allegedly, okay, so what are men, when we normalize their testosterone, going to feel like doing? Right? Okay. And we know that testosterone improves erectile function. Oh, so with our control group, we must improve erectile function. So the control group got Viagra or Cialis. And the study group got testosterone. Well, it so happens that Viagra was originally researched as a blood pressure lowering agent. And Viagra and Cialis, to an extent, unload some of the pressure on the heart. So what you were getting was the testosterone group, which was allegedly the study group, they were actually the placebo group. And the active studied group were the ones that were having their heart unloaded. And of course they had fewer strokes and heart attacks. That's, and, and it was, but it was reported as testosterone is the killer hormone. 
Misattribution of causality. I mean, something happened and therefore it was the testosterone that did it. Not reporting all of the data and discussing it in a balanced abstract, in a balanced fashion, your abstract. I see this all the time. Most people only read the abstracts. They don't read the entire article. Using an inadequate dose of studied medication. Oh, you know, we used uh, Centrum Silver and we didn't see a whole lot and therefore vitamins don't work. That's using an inadequate amount. <clears throat> Interestingly, in the physician's health study, Centrum Silver was used and it dropped the amount of cancer in the docs, the male docs that were studied. Uh, using toxic or noxious doses of medication. Well, just give them a toxic level of a vitamin and then claim that it didn't work or it was harmful. That, that's stupid, but that's done all the time. Use contaminated impure test medication, use a therapeutic placebo. So the therapeutic placebo, I'll give you a couple of examples. Therapeutic placebo, we talked about Viagra and Cialis in that study. There was another study ostensibly purporting that food additives um, did not increase hyperactive symptoms in children. And it was funded by the Food Additive Council, basically. And in the placebo group, the placebo group was treated with cookies. <laughs> okay. And then confusing the sick user phenomenon. Vitamins don't work because there are sick people taking vitamins and they're sick. Okay. I can't, I do not want to bog down, but here are some of the ways that people can lie on their studies. So I'm going to close it out and talk about my own little personal adventure. So back in October 2013, I went down to my, and I won't tell you which high school reunion it was, but it's in the multiple decades. And uh, I, I grew up in Texas with the good old boys. The, uh, the, the favorite thing there where I grew up was the Four States Fair and Rodeo. I was a classically trained pianist, a male classically trained pianist. <laughs> Where the four states fair and rodeo, and also Friday Night Lights. How many of you saw that TV? Yeah, wasn't, I won a jock, went on the football, I did not fit in. So these are obviously a couple of the larger good old boys that I grew up with, and they have continued to increase in their girth, and you can see that right there. And I realized that, in fact, I had increased in my girth, and so I should do something about it. So I came back, and I started this, this TR90 product. Now, you do not have to do TR90. I'm not here to sell you TR90. This is not some Tupperware sales gathering. I've already told you how you lose weight. 30 grams of protein or, or that calculation three times a day. Don't eat the high glycemic stuff and you also have to exercise a reasonable amount. So this is where I started back in October and this is where I finished 90 days later. And that's the picture that Lisa shot in my office right across from uh, where we are right now. So this, is the, this would be the Mac. This is the Apple. This is the right brain version. This is the picture. But the PC version, the left brain, the analytical kind, that's here. So if any of you are contemplating going on a weight reduction program <clears throat> or a body contour body composition improving program. I suggest you get one of these babies. Now they're not cheap, but they are amazingly fuss free. It's a uh, Withings body analyzer. And you stand on it and it gets your weight. It gets your weight and your body fat and wirelessly communicates it to your cell phone every day. So you can watch your data. And I'm going to show you my data. So here's my data. I started out at 168.5 pounds. I'm not ashamed to tell you. October 28th. And so this is what I had tried to do before it and this is actually where I started on the program. And I lost 10 pounds of total weight uh, which was 6% of my body. And uh, I didn't really particularly strain. I had a couple of desserts. I'd wash down some of my evening meals with a nice refined glass of Cabernet. I mean, I wasn't white knuckling it with this program. And I lost 7.7 .7 pounds of fat. So you can see the fat loss right there. This is percent body fat going down. And so 7.7 .7 pounds of fat loss divided by 10 pounds of total loss is 77% of my weight was off of my 
fat, not muscle. That's critical. So does eating an adequate amount of protein keep you from losing muscle and predominantly have you burn fat? Yes, I proved it. So you say, well, that's, very, that's all well and good, doc, but okay, so what's gonna happen when that stuff runs out? So I continue to monitor my data. So here is pre-TR90, I lost a grand total of three pounds. Here is where I started, and here's TR90, done imperfectly, and I lost uh, 10 or 11 pounds, de depending on whether you rounded it. And here's what happened after I finished. I lost three more pounds. Remember, what you eat talks to your genes. You remember my telling you that before? So if you eat protein and veggies and you talk to your genes, it says, oh, well, I'm not supposed to build a gut. I'm not supposed to build fat. I'm supposed to burn it. I'm supposed to be metabolically active. I'm supposed to make muscle. And so the goodness continues. And I will tell you, I have gained, I believe, um, two or three pounds since here. But it's, it's basically staying off. My, my friend Alan Buck saw me tonight and said, you're going to be down to one stripe on your pajamas. I liked that. <laughs> I'm going to close this with what one of my mentors, a guy named John Asaraf, said. Now, anybody that's worth a billion dollars, I pay attention to. John used to own Remax of Indiana. He actually sold the whole state. He sold it right before the real estate crash hit. So he sold it at the top. Uh, very smart businessman. This is on his hilltop estate in Rancho Santa Fe, California, surrounded by orange trees. And, and uh, I mean, on his property. So I was there for a seminar. He said, oh yeah, if any of you are on break, just feel free to pull some of the oranges off the trees, enjoy it, take some home with you. Best oranges I ever had. But anyway, John said, when you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at change. And, you know, it's kind of cute, but I think it's very profound. And I will tell you that when I changed the way that I looked at food and also nutrition, um, the things that I looked at changed. So here are my key down-home principles that we talked about tonight. Jumpstart your genes. Eliminate the junk. Pitch it. If you don't have it, you can't eat it. Go have a trashing party if, if you're serious about this. Go home and throw out the junk. Develop a taste for low glycemic fruit. Um, I love ostrich jerky or the balanced protein carb bars. If you haven't tried it, I know it sounds sick, but it's actually very tasty. I'm particularly fond of the sweet and spicy ones. 30 grams of protein at a minimum within a half to one hour of awakening. 30 grams was about right for me. I, I might have done a little bit more, but make sure that you go through and calculate it. Eat real food. Eat real food. Not, if, if it comes in a wrapper and it doesn't have to be refrigerated, it's probably not real. Minimize eating out. It'll actually drop your, your, uh, your, your, your food bills. No fast food, no fast food, no fast food. I was able to do this. I ate at a Mexican restaurant one time and as I was doing so, I looked around with absolute incredulity at people stuffing their faces. And I found that the more they were stuffing, the fatter they were. <laughs> there was probably a cause and effect relationship going on there, don't you think? And so, as, as a result of that, I thought about writing an essay called Breaking Bad on TR90, but I have not yet done it, but I, I think I still will. So no fast food. And <clears throat> axiom, if you're full of the good stuff, you won't be craving or eating the bad stuff. So closing with the words of that great sage of your Yogi Berra, if I hadn't believed it, I wouldn't have seen it. And the question is, so what are you going to do about what you heard tonight? Now, before you go, 
I would very much appreciate, at least I'm going to call you up here, I would very much appreciate if you would take some time and fill out one of those rating forms, Yeah, because I'm always trying to get better. If you found something that you really liked, put it down. If I can quote you, that would be great. I want to know what you're going to go home, what, what are the take-home messages that you're going to act on from this lecture. So that's what I've got for you. Uh, thanks for coming, and Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you wrap it up. Have you been well